All right, Judges chapter 12, so we're finishing up um, the, the judgeship of Jephthah this evening. So we're looking at Judges chapter 12. It's a short chapter, so the sermon's only 11 minutes long. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so we'll see if we can find something in here. Um, that's the one thing about the Bible is that you just read through these stories and there's just so many lessons. It doesn't even matter how many verses really that you read. You can always find some good stuff in there. So Judges chapter 12. Let's just finish up the story of Jephthah. So, of course, the, the previous story, when Jephthah took over as the judge and he freed um, the Gileadites from the Ammonites in uh, Judges chapter 11, this finishes up the battle. Of course, we went through Jephthah's oath that he um, swore unto God if God would deliver him from the battle, which God did. And then we talked about that in Judges chapter 11, so go ahead and check that out if you missed that sermon. But in Judges chapter 12, let's look down at verse number 1. And the Bible says, And the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together, and went northward, and said unto Jephthah, Wherefore passest thou over to fight against the children of Ammon, and didst not call us to go with thee? We will burn thine house upon thee with fire. So, I mean, nice people, right? <laughs> so basically, um, the men of Ephraim, it, they saw that you know, Jephthah had fought the children of Ammon, and that he had, he had won this great victory, and they came to him, and they said, Hey, how come you didn't call us to the battle? You know, how come you didn't come get us? And not only that, it was because you didn't come get us, we're going you know, to kill you, basically, right? And, uh, you know, turn to Judges chapter 8. There's a very similar story about this in Judges. We've already gone over it. Um, but there's two different outcomes um, in these two um, situations. But in verse number 2 of Judges 12, the Bible says, And Jetsah said unto them, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon. And when I called you, you delivered me not out of their hands. And when I saw that ye delivered me not, I put my life in my hands and passed over against the children of Ammon, and the Lord delivered them into mine hand. Wherefore then are ye come up unto me this day to fight against me? So look at Judges chapter 8, and we see this same group of people causing sort of the same type of trouble. Okay, so it's the same people, and they're saying to, um, at this time, they're saying to Gideon, they're saying, hey, why didn't you call us? So Gideon, of course, had a great victory, uh, you know, maybe one of the best uh, victories um, you could possibly even think of with just 300 men. Gideon uh, defeated this entire army. And look at verse number one of Judges 8. And the men of Ephraim, same guys, same tribe, okay, said unto him, Why hast thou served us thus, that thou called us not, and when thou wentest to fight the Midianites? And they did chide with him sharply. So, you know, it doesn't say that they Specifically, they threatened his life here, but it did say they chided with him sharply. I mean, they, had, they were having harsh words with Gideon here. So basically, what we're seeing here in Judges chapter 8 and Judges chapter 12 is a pattern of behavior from this uh, tribe of Ephraim, or these men of Ephraim. Now, Gideon, we talked about this in Judges chapter 8, he handles it sort of the opposite way that Jephthah handles it. Okay, so... Gideon basically diffuses the situation. Gideon tells the, the men of Ephraim, he's like, you're great. You guys are the best. I mean, why are you even having problems? You know, because they had a little victory and they, they had these three princes that they defeated. And, you know, Jephthah basically in verse number two, he said unto them, what now have I done in comparison of you? He's like, you are the best. Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? God had delivered you into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb, and it was what was and what was I able to do in comparison of you? Then their anger was abated towards him when he had said that. So he basically puffs them up and tells them how great they are. Now Jephthah, go back to verse uh, chapter number twelve. Jephthah, on the other hand, he takes it in a different direction. Okay, so they threaten to burn his house down, and Jephthah, well, look at verse number four. Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. So he basically just went to war with them. And the men of Gilead smote Ephraim because they said, Ye Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manassites. And the Gileads, Gileadites took the passages of Jordan before the Ephraimites. And it was so that when the Ephraimites were escaped and said, Let me go over, that the men of Gilead said unto him, Art thou an Ephraimite? And, and he, if he said, Nay... Then said they unto him, Now say now, Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth, for he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him at the passages of Jordan, and there fell at the time of the Ephraimites forty and two thousand. So forty-two thousand. So basically, 
What Jephthah does is he just goes to war with these men. He doesn't try to make peace. He just goes straight to war with them. They have a battle. They defeat them. And not only do they defeat them, when they're trying to cross back over the Jordan River to um, their home, the, the um, Jephthah's men, the Gileadites, basically stop all these fleeing soldiers and kill them. And how do they know um, who they were? Well, they had an accent, apparently. Apparently, these men had, uh, fr if, you were from, um, if you were from Ephraim, you had an accent, and you had a problem with the SH uh, pronunciation, apparently. Okay? Now, I mean, look, this is very um, common that people just can't pronounce certain things. I remember um, when I moved for the first time from North Dakota to Texas, people loved when I said the word boat. And now I'm saying it normal now because I've, I've trained myself. But when I was from North Dakota, you know, you would say boat. You'd say, oh, yeah, we had a boat. You know, and I would say, you know, kind of that long O. Oh. And people from Texas, I mean, people, I mean, they were, you know, just they couldn't believe it. And they're like, hey, guys, come over here. Jared, say boat again. You know, it's kind of like shibboleth, sibboleth. It's basically the same thing. And I, I was like, boat, you know, and I would say it how I would normally say it. And they would all, wow, wow. And these guys are from Texas, and they sound like the weirdest people I've ever heard in my life. I mean, you ever heard somebody, you ever never, you ever not been to the South and then go to the South for the first time? How many remember that experience? I mean, when you hear somebody with a Southern accent for the first time, I mean, it's fairly shocking. You know, you're just like, whoa, you know, what is this all about, right? Y'all? And, uh, but anyway, so accents are a very real thing, and in this case, Jephthah's men use these accents to sort out who the Gileadites were, and he killed all of the ones trying to get back home as well. So, look, he, he took care of the situation thoroughly, okay, to the tune of 40 and 2,000 men. Look down in verse number 7. And the Bible says, And Jephthah judged Israel six years, then died, Je then died Jephthah the Gileadite, and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. And after him, Ibzan the Bethlehemite judged Israel, and he had thirty sons and thirty daughters, whom he sent abroad, and took in thirty daughters from abroad for his sons, and he judged Israel seven years. So we're going through a few different judges here. We just aren't given much information about these judges. Then died Ibzan and was buried at Bethlehem. And after him, Elon, a Zebulonite, judged Israel and invented a car. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> So I wonder if that's where Elon, uh, his, his parents got his name from the Bible. I don't know, probably not. Anyway, um, and after Elon, a Zebulonite, I'm just seeing if you're awake, okay? Are you awake this evening? And after him, Elon, a Zebulonite, judged Israel. He judged Israel 10 years, and he got government subsidies for all his cars that he built. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Okay, I'm done. I'm done. All right, verse number 12. And Elon, the Zebulonite, died and was buried in Aegine, the country of Zebulon. And after him, Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Perithonite, judged Israel. And he had 40 sons and 30 nephews that rode on threescore and ten ass colts. And he judged Israel eight years. And Abdon, the son of Hillel, and per the Perithonite, died and was buried in Parathon in the land of Ephraim in the Mount of the Amicalites. So we see a number of different judges that we go through there to finish off the chapter. But really what I want to do this evening when we look at just what we can learn from this short chapter in the Bible in this last section of Jephthah's life, of his, of his judgeship, I guess you could call it, is I want to understand Ephraim. I want to understand Ephraim and see where did they come from, you know, what, it, what was it that made, them in this, that made them have this pattern of behavior and what can we take from that. That's really what I want to look at this evening. So turn to Genesis chapter 48. Let's look at who Ephraim was. You know, some of this will be just for your information, just so you can learn a little bit about the Bible uh, this evening. But turn to Genesis chapter 48, and we'll look at who Ephraim was. So basically, Joseph was in Egypt at this time, and Joseph had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, in Egypt. And Jacob, when Jacob came to join um, Joseph, you remember, Joseph was the number two man in the kingdom at this point. He had these two sons. Look down at Genesis chapter 48. Basically, Jacob adopted these two sons. So if you look at the 12 tribes of Israel, and you ever go look at a map of the 12 tribes of Israel, basically Joseph's tribes, or Joseph's land, was broken up and split between Manasseh and Ephraim. Okay, and of course then you had East Manasseh 
that broke into, it's kind of confusing. You had the, Manasseh was broken into two, one settled on the east side of the Jordan, one on the west side, and then you had Ephraim. So you won't really find a tribe, a map of Joseph's land, because it was broken into Manasseh and Ephraim, these two boys right here. And in Genesis chapter 48, it shows you that Jacob basically adopted, when he's blessing his sons, he basically adopted Manasseh and Ephraim, his grandsons, as his sons. Okay, so we see that in Genesis 48, in verse number 5, where the Bible says, And now thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, he's talk, this is Jacob talking to um, Joseph, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt before I came unto thee in Egypt, are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. So he's saying, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat them like my sons, he says, okay, as he's giving the blessings. And then in verse number 17, for sake of time, in Genesis 48, and when Joseph, so basically he blesses, he blesses the two sons, and he basically, he blessed, he gave the first blessing to Ephraim, who was the youngest. And the, the, the first blessing is supposed to go to the oldest child. Okay, so Joseph stops him here, and he's basically trying to correct his father in verse 17, where he says, And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. So Manasseh was the firstborn. Manasseh was the oldest. And put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. So, all this to say this, I mean, this is just some information for you on the Bible, but all that to say this, Ephraim became a great nation in Israel, okay? And even in, when the kingdoms broke apart after Judges, when the kingdoms broke apart, Ephraim was the largest tribe in the northern kingdom of Israel, okay? They were, that's where Samaria was. It's, they were many times in the Bible, in the prophets, in the major prophets when you're reading the Bible, it will refer to the northern kingdom as just Ephraim in, in many cases. Okay, but look, I mean, great men in the Bible like Joshua, like Samuel, and of course Jeroboam, the very first king of the northern kingdom of Israel, were from Ephraim. Okay, so Ephraim was kind of the, uh, what do you want to say, the, the big the big tribe of Israel, and even especially in the northern kingdom of Israel, they were the main tribe, okay? So let's look at this situation with Ephraim, now that we know that, and see what we can take um, from them. And the first thing that I want to show is, from this situation with Ephraim, is handling situations. Now that we know, um, you know, about Ephraim and kind of maybe what makes them tick, we have Jephthah and Gideon that both dealt with this situation with Ephraim. Turn to Romans chapter 12. And the question is, since they both dealt with these situations differently, the question is, who handled it the best? Who handled it correctly? Look at Romans chapter 12 and verse number 18. Look at Romans chapter 12 and verse number 18. Now I'm using this situation, look, I'm using this situation to compare and contrast what the Bible says we should do in situations. I wasn't there when Jephthah was dealing with these men, and I wasn't there when Gideon was dealing with these men, so I'm not necessarily saying that either one of them was right or wrong, but I'm just going to use this as an example in the Bible of how to handle things in your life. Look at Romans 12, 18. The Bible says, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. So that's a pretty direct statement right there. It's saying, look, it says, if it's possible, if it's possible, live peaceably with all men. Look, turn to Matthew chapter 5. So obviously, in Gideon's situation, we know that it was possible because he was able to defuse the situation. Would Jephthah have been able to defuse this situation? Maybe, maybe not. We don't know. We'll never know. Okay, but we know that Gideon, you know, he basically swallowed his pride and he, he defused this situation and he was able to live peaceably in this situation at his own expense. He was basically to say to them, you're better than me, it's fine, at, his own, at the expense of his own pride, or maybe at the expense of his humility, he was able to defuse the situation. He did what Romans 12, 18 says we should do. Look at Matthew 5, 9. The Bible says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. So once again, we see the same concept here. If it's possible, you should make peace. 
if it's possible. So we don't know if it was possible for Jephthah to make peace or not. There's certainly no indication that he tried, but maybe he did and it's just uh, not listed there. But look, um, Gideon certainly matches both Romans 12 and Matthew, number, Matthew chapter number 5. Okay, so look, let's talk about de-escalating situations or being someone that can de-escalate situations in your life. Look, this is a seriously valuable skill if you can do this. If you are the kind of person who can walk into a situation that is very contentious, whether it be you and somebody else, or it be another group of people that are at each other's throats over something, whether it be business, maybe it's a physical altercation, whatever, I mean, you will be a very valuable person if you can learn how to successfully de-escalate things. Think about um, you know, business situations, customer service. I mean, could you ever be, um, could you ever be a waiter? if you know you didn't know how to de-escalate situations you ever heard the customer is always right i mean that's that's what you're doing is you're de-escalating situations look the customer is not always right usually the customer is just being a jerk that's the truth of it okay when you say the customer is always right basically what you're doing is when you give somebody something and they say well you didn't give me the right thing and you did you just say okay i'm sorry how can i make that better for you you know, you're de-escalating that situation. You're just taking that, um, you're, you're basically suffering yourself to be defrauded for in the situation, to de-escalate the situation. Customer service, sales, I mean, these are very valuable skills to have in business. Think of uh, law enforcement. I mean, law enforcement officers take, you know, training, some maybe are better at it than others, uh, to de-escalate situations. And if a law enforcement officer is extremely good at de-escalating a situation, it could mean that someone's life could be saved. It could mean that someone may not, you know, get killed in a situation like that, which is why it's so important to de-escalate in situations like that. Think about it personally. Think about de-escalating situations just in your personal life. You could avoid conflict. Look, I'm telling you, if you ever get in a, if, if you're an adult, you know, man, and you get in a physical conflict in your life at that point, it's probably because you, you're not very good at de-escalating situations. Now, I'm not saying there's not a situation where you may need to defend yourself or your family, but look, you should try to de-escalate first. There's always, a, you know, try to live peaceably at every um, turn when, until you can't, okay? But look, this takes self-control to do this. It takes self-control. Many times you want to get in the flesh and you just want to fulfill vengeance yourself. Right? I mean, you just get angry and you get rageful and you want to just satisfy that temper, which is the opposite, basically, of what Gideon did in Judges chapter 8. Okay? Gideon defused his own temper. You know, Gideon was obviously, you know, a mighty man. Uh, Gideon was no, you know, effeminate weakling. I mean, Gideon was a mighty man of war, and, you know, I'm sure he was angry at the men of Ephraim when they said what they said to him, but. He was able to overcome that, all right? So look, somebody with a temper, let's talk about this. I remember there was a kid that um, I went to high school with, and I, I'll never forget this kid, because he just, he had such a temper problem. I'm sure he, I'm sure he if he didn't go to jail, he's, he's been in jail. Because the kid, I mean, somebody one time, you know, threw a snowball at him, you know, just threw a snowball at him. And he was like 13 or 14 years old, and he went and he got a screwdriver, and he smashed the, the person's windows out of their car. I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? That, he just had this temper that would just break, and he was just filled with rage. And I mean, my friends and I were just like, that guy's going to kill somebody one day. That guy's just going to lose, I mean, he's, gonna, he's destined for prison. But look, you're just constantly overreacting to situations. I'm not saying this was the case with Jephthah. Quite frankly, maybe the men of Ephraim, it was time for them to learn their lesson the hard way, but we'll contrast it anyway. But look, I think we can say that while Jephthah was a great man of God, that you know, he didn't necessarily have the best decision-making ability. <laughs> I think you can say that in the Bible. Turn to Titus chapter 1. Let's look at this idea of a temper or losing your temper. And let's see what the Bible has to say about this. This is actually something when we're talking about the qualifications for somebody that wants to be in the ministry, for a pastor, for a bishop. This is something that's brought up several times. Okay, In Titus chapter 1, look at verse number 7. And the Bible says this. It says, For a bishop, that's the same as a pastor, must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, 
not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught, that he may be able to maybe may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayer. So there's several things listed here, but I would point out that three of these things have to do with a man controlling his temper or controlling his anger. Another thing I want to point out here is the Bible says be slow to anger, and it also says here, it says not soon angry. We were talking about this before the church service. It says not soon angry, and then it says, um, talking about violence once again, no striker. He's not going to be the kind of person that just immediately, you're talking to him, he doesn't like something you say, and he just punches you in the face, right? I mean, and then it says temperate in verse number eight. You know, somebody that is just, that has a, a decent manner about them and is able to control their emotions. Okay, you can't have a pastor who's just all over the boards, this, this manic, depressive, crazy person that any one thing happens and he's angry and then he's, you know, happy and then he's angry again and he just goes off with a short fuse. It's, there's a reason that there, when the Bible repeats things, there's a reason for it. Okay, there's a reason that three of these items here have to do with, you know, your physical temperament in, um, as, as, you know, a qualification for somebody who could lead a ministry. But I do want to say, as we were talking about before the service, look, it doesn't, the Bible never says never get angry. Okay? I mean, what kind of man would you be? What kind of man would you, would you be if you just never got angry at anything? I mean, you would not be a man. If everybody could just roll over you, and no matter what happened, I mean, I, I don't think your wife would appreciate that. I don't think your wife would appreciate the fact that you know, she's married to a man who just never gets angry at anything. Oh, you know, there's nothing, you know, whatever. They're breaking into her. Oh, it's fine. You know, and just, you know, you never get angry at anything and never have. It says slow to anger. It says soon angry. It's always talking about, you know, how long it takes you to get angry. Do you consider the situation? Do you try to find those situations where, hey, is there a, a way for me to get out of this in peace? Is there a way for me to live peaceable in this situation? Is there a way that I could de-escalate this? Is there, look, that takes time to think about all those things. It takes time to go back and forth with somebody and talk about if there's a solution to the problem. Or I could just get man, you know, angry and you know, solve the problem with a chair to the face. Right? That's, that's not slow to anger. Right? So that's what the Bible's talking about. It's, it's about your ability to control your temp well, uh, temptation. I mean, it, it's a temptation to have a temper. It's a temptation for a man to lose his temper. I mean, some of you have seen me angry once or twice in, in this ministry so far. And I hope I wasn't you know, quick to anger, but in that one particular situation, maybe two, I was very angry. So it's okay to get angry at times. It's just if you're just angry dynamite stick constantly going off, it's no good. Turn to Proverbs chapter 15. Look, I mean, here's the thing. I mean, I mean fighting, and maybe this is not, maybe this is, uh, you know, not, is kind of a surprise to, to women and girls, but look, fighting is a temptation for a man. I'm telling you, there are times in a man's life where fighting or not fighting is a temptation, where, where a man will just, will really want to fight. What do I mean? Fight? No, I mean like physically fight. There are situations like that in a man's life. I mean, it's, it's kind of by men's nature to, to solve things that way. So we have to kind of fight that nature. Proverbs 15, a wrathful man stirreth up strife. So that's the opposite of de-escalation. So it says a wrathful, a wrathful man, an angry man, he takes a situation and he makes it worse. He takes a situation that maybe is small and makes it a big thing and just stirs up big problems. But, what's the opposite of that? He that is slow to anger, there it is, appeaseth strife. So just the fact, look, just the fact that you're not quick angry, the Bible here is telling you, you're like, I don't know how to defuse situations. I'm not good with words. I'm not, you know, I'm not this great people person that can just convince people to, you know, not be, you know, upset or whatever. Well, it just says here, it says, being slow to anger will appease wrath. I mean, it says just, just the fact that you're not quick, because look, if you get angry, you have a person that's angry, and you have another person that's angry, 
then they just get angrier and angrier and it just it just builds on itself whereas if you have somebody that's just they're slow to anger and they might think about situations more it, it's just the fact that they're slow to anger will appease strife in many situations okay so look in a man where this is unchecked it's no good okay so we don't want a man who had just has unchecked anger well how does that happen how does a man end up in his life where he just has unchecked anger, he has a short fuse, and he just goes off like this. Well, it starts when he's a kid. Guaranteed. Because guess what? I knew this kid's parents. This guy that was quick to anger. I knew his parents. And, and he just would get whatever he wanted by just throwing a fit over everything. And I'm telling you, it created a monster when he was a teenager and later on in his life when he was an adult. So let's talk about, you know, what do we call this in children? We call it temper tantrums. When kids throw temper tantrums, you say, oh, you know, look, temper tantrums are a big deal. I mean, that is what the Bible is talking about here. A kid having, a child having a temper tantrum is being quick to anger, is being, you know, not slow to anger. So you need to be very careful with your kids when they throw temper tantrums and it is something that needs to be corrected when it happens. You need to recognize it. You say, so look, here's the, here's the mistake people will make. They will look at a situation and a child doesn't get something. Uh, can I have this toy at a store? And the answer is no, you can't have the toy and the temper tantrum happens. And then the parents will think it's about the toy. No, the punishment is because of the temper tantrum. It's because of the fact that something didn't go your way and you were quick to anger and a child needs to be taught that that is not okay. The worst thing that you could do is reward a temper tantrum. Amen. That is the worst thing as a parent that you could do because what you are doing is you are training your children to be quick to anger. You say, well, they're four. They're two. Look, two-year-olds throw temper tantrums. Yeah. I mean, one-and-a-half-year-olds you know, I don't know about one and a half year olds. It's been a long time. But okay, Brother Ryan's shaking his head. They throw temper tantrums, okay? I'm, I'm old, okay? It's, 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 uh, it's been a long time since so I've had a one and a half year old. But look, the, the bottom line is that kids from the very youngest age can be quick to anger and they need to be taught to not be that way. It's not going to happen on accident. It's their nature to want the toy or want this and you're gonna train them to do it every single time. But look, here's the problem. If you're in a grocery store or whatever, my wife used to call me all the time. She's like, oh, I had a whole thing at groceries and I just had to leave the store. Because, you know, one of the kids threw a fit and I just left the store, the whole cart there and the whole thing and took the kids home and spanked them, right? So look, you can't reward it. At the beginning, when you're in the store, it might be easier to just give it to them and just make the problem go away. That's the worst thing you can do. Don't do that. Okay, look, it's, it's easier, it's less embarrassing, but it's, a, it's gonna create a long-term problem for you. Okay, you're training them to be soon angry. Turn to Proverbs chapter 25. And then, look, then you're gonna raise, you're gonna raise a child who's gonna be a Proverbs 25 child and then you're going to have no recourse. Look, you got all kinds of, look, parents, you have all kinds of re recourse when these kids are two, three, four, when they're young, when they're below 10. You know, look, you still have recourse when they're above 10. But look, the corrections are going to get smaller that you can make when they get to be older. When you have an 18 or a 19 or a 20 year old, I mean, and you need to make major corrections there, well, you're going to have a problem. You better have the course pretty much set by the time they're 18 or 19 years old. I mean, look, there's some, major, there's some minor corrections that need to be made along the way, always. But if you've got major corrections to make at that point, eh, it's not going to work out. It's not going to work out. You're going to have a Proverbs 25, 28 on your hands. The Bible says, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. You ever met a kid like this? Have you ever met a kid like this that just has no rule over his own spirit? Yes, I'm sure you have. And here's the thing. These parents, they just want to give their kids everything just to make them happy. They have the most miserable kids ever. They create children that have no rule over their own spirit and they're like, they're like, wall, they're like cities with broken down walls. They're not happy. They're miserable human beings. And guess what? Then you raise an adult 
that is a city with broken down walls, that has no rule over his own spirit. Hello, King Saul. No rule over his own spirit. So I, I'm, I'm all of a sudden, I'm angry. I'm going to kill you with the javelin. My own son. I mean, I'm all of a sudden angry, and I'm just going to try to kill you immediately. I go from straight from zero to I want to kill you now. I mean, how do you like to hang out with somebody like that? That's, that's a person that has no rule over his own spirit. Look, ultimately, I mean, how did that work out for Saul? I mean, it cost him his life. It cost him his life in the end. I mean, God finally was finished with him. It cost him his life. On an individual level, that kind of thing will destroy you. So, I mean, why would you ever want to raise your children to be like that? I mean, think about it on a, on a family level. You can, now you can take it to a group level. We're going to get to, to Ephraim, and we're going to see that this is kind of how the nation of Ephraim was. But let's just look at a family level. Look, you can raise a family to be like this, to just have no rule over their own spirit, to just be, you know, just to be angry, just to be angry and vengeful all the time. I don't know if you ever heard the story of the Hatfields and McCoys. I mean, it's a real story. I mean, you hear about it in folklore and songs and things like that, but it's actually a real story that happened in the 1860s in the Kentucky area, the United States. You had two families in the 1860s, and it, the whole thing started over a pig. Over Somebody thought that this guy owned the pig, and somebody thought this family owned the pig, and at the end of this whole thing, it lasted like 30 years, and somebody killed one of them. It was right after the Civil War. There was some Union Confederate stuff going on there, but look, the point is that one, one of them killed one of them, and then they would kill two of the other ones, and it just kept this big war. And there was like 30, there was dozens of people dead by the time this whole feud was done. I mean, the government got involved and came in, the federal government came into this situation and arrested people and tried to stop this feud. But look, this is just unchecked anger. And obviously you have a family here who's raising children to have unchecked anger to raising children to just not have any control over their temper or anything like that. And Ephraim is a, a national example of this, of just this, this nation that is just, I mean, look, they're like, why didn't you call us? Why didn't you call us to come fight? We're going to burn your house down. I mean, they're going to kill him. So they basically, they, I mean, they literally threatened to kill Jephthah in the same verse that they asked him why he didn't call, call him to battle. They're very, very quick to anger, very quick to um, lose their temper over situations. But let me give you a, so that, that's, a, that's an example for Ephraim. Let me give you a secondary application, looking at Ephraim and kind of trying to think about what made them tick and what made them do what they did. We obviously know that they had, um, you know, some, some anger issues here, that they had some, some problems, but look, the men of Ephraim, if you look at verse number 1 of Judges chapter 12, let's look at just these, these verses here. And, and men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and went northward and said unto Jephthah, Wherefore passest thou over to fight against the children of Ammon, and didst not call us to go with thee? Look at verse number 1 of chapter 8. And the men of Ephraim said unto him, Why hast thou served us thus? And thou called us not when thou wentst to fight with the Midianites. And they did chide with him sharply. Look, these guys, they threatened, and, and I, like, I like Jephthah's response in the fact that it does explain, Jephthah explains, he's like, look, the Ammonites were oppressing us for years. He's like, where were you? He's like, we called you to help us when we were under you know, the enslavement of these people, and you did nothing. But now that the battle is basically won, now they want to come in. Now they want to win um, the battle. Now that Ammon is on the run, now Ephraim wants to come in. <clears throat> Ephraim, and we learned this from Genesis chapter 48, they became this big, powerful tribe. And they, it shows you here in Judges chapter 8 and Judges chapter 12 that they were the type of people that not only were they quick to anger, but they, were, they, they wanted to have the preeminence. They did not want to have a situation happening where someone was gaining a great victory and they were not part of it. Or they were not, they didn't get credit for it. No, they didn't want to be the first ones. Look, they didn't want to be the one to walk up to the bully and punch him in the face first. But when the bully was on the ground, they wanted to be able to walk up and give him a couple kicks themselves and say, look what we did. That's Ephraim. 
They were very prideful. And look, they were cowards. They were babies. And, I mean, turn to Isaiah chapter 28. This cost them throughout their history. Turn to Isaiah chapter 28. <clears throat> the basis of their problem is what? Isaiah chapter 28, look at verse number 1. Isaiah chapter 28 and verse number 1. The Bible says this. It says, woe to the crown of what? It says, woe to the crown of pride. To the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower. So they were this big, powerful tribe, and they were a bunch of drunks. It says their beauty was this fading flower. They used to be great, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. Turn to Hosea chapter 4. They used to be this great, powerful nation. Now all they were was this prideful nation. We probably should learn this lesson as a nation. But look, I mean, just like Ephraim, some things you just have to learn the hard way. Learn, turn to Hosea chapter 4. Hosea chapter 4, look at verse number 17. Again, the Bible says, Ephraim, so this is talking about, you know, Ephraim, this is talking about that, that nation and now the northern kingdom of Israel, you know, as they're going to go into captivity, or not into even a captivity, into destruction by the Assyrian Empire. In verse 17 of Hosea 4, the Bible says, Ephraim is joined to idols, let him alone. Their drink is sour. They have committed whoredom continually. Her rulers with, with shame do love give, give ye. Look at uh, Hosea 12, 14. The Bible says, Ephraim provoked him to anger most bitterly, therefore shall he leave his blood upon him, and his reproach shall be his Lord, and his reproach shall his Lord return unto him. He's saying, look, Ephraim's gonna pay. You know, they they provoked the Lord to anger, they were prideful, they were drunks, they were the most proud, they were the worst nation in the north that turned against God. The capital was in their, their country or in their, their area, the capital of Samaria. Jeroboam was from there. And we, we can see it all begin here. We can see the problems with Ephraim beginning before the northern kingdom even existed. We can see it beginning in Judges. So don't miss this. I mean, these, these things in the Bible, in Judges chapter 8, Judges chapter 12, this is giving you kind of a, a preview of what is going to happen to the northern kingdom of Israel that doesn't even exist yet in Judges chapter 8 and Judges chapter 12. All from pride as the source. So look, it's always better to think of yourself as blessed than proud. Okay? I mean, that's, it was on the prayer list. Somebody put it on the prayer list. What a great prayer. You know, help us to just realize our blessings and not, you know, help you know, us not get puffed up over our blessings. So let's talk about, you know, modern-day Ephraims. You know, how can we apply this idea of Ephraim and their pride and they're needing to have this preeminence. And they never want to be the one to start the trouble. They never wanted to be the one to actually do the right thing. But they wanted to get in there and claim the victory. They wanted to get in there when the work was done and claim the victory. So now look, this is kind of people. I mean, think about people that just they don't go to church. But they go around to conferences. You know, they, their, their life is like, is like a three or four time a year Christian vacation. That's their spiritual life. Right? I mean, that actually, before we moved, before we moved, and before we, you know, decided to move, when we came here to visit, that was kind of my preliminary plan that was working in my head. I was like, all right, I could just put some, some uh, money to the side, and we could just come and we could visit, you know, uh, a place like this, or conferences like this, two or three times a year, and I could just commit to, you know, making sure that we do that, you know, we could take these Christian vacations, but look, you know, we just, you know, I, I knew that, that lasted about five minutes, that whole thought process, that thought experiment of mine, because I knew that, you know, we would always be, we would never be the ones that were in the fight. We would never be the ones that were actually, you know, serving in a church. You know, the, another one is these internet warriors. You know, the internet warriors that are, that are constantly on the internet, you know, making all the comments and, and causing all the strife on the internet, and they don't even go to church anywhere. I mean, it's crazy. My favorite ones, my favorite ones, I just saw one of these the other day, is when you get somebody that comments, I mean, there's a good biblical sermon, and then somebody comments on the sermon and, like, asks a question, and then you get some internet warrior that, that answers the question with false doctrine. <laughs> It's like, you can't make this stuff up. You know, but they don't go to church anywhere. They don't know anything. 
You know, they're, they're just they're a modern-day Christian Ephraim is what they are. They're all puffed up with pride. They think they've got everything figured out. But look, they're never going to fight the Christian battles that come along with living the Christian life. You say fights. You say, you know, what, what, what kind of fights? Well, I don't know, like week, week in and week out being sold out for a church? That's like, you know, that's the Gideon right there. You know, how about this one? How about this fight? Like cleaning the church. I mean, look, that's the Jephthah right there. You know, that, I mean, supporting the church. I mean, look, look, I mean, cleaning the church. I mean, look, that is, that's a fight. Okay? You know, here, you know, cleaning this church especially. <laughs> I'm not even going to go off on it. But I mean, the thing is, it, it's just, it's the week in, the week out things that maybe aren't the most glamorous things. You're not going to get a trophy for, hey, you won the big battle for cleaning up the chairs or, or stacking chairs or, or putting chairs back or whatever, right? But that's the Jephthahs, that's the Gideons, the ones that are in the fight and serving. Look, it's not always... The thing is, the, people misunderstand that this Christian life is supposed to be like... Or people mis, let me just put it this way. I read a story today, I'm going to tell you about it. But people think that this life is just about glamour and fun and entertainment. And it's such, a, it's such a weird problem. I think it's mostly, I don't even think it's really an American problem. I read this story today. I'm going to tell you about it. I read this story today, and it was about this situation that happened in, it was like 1980, 1981, 1982, something along those lines. This young kid, he was Israeli, and he got out of the Israeli uh, military, and his parents wanted him to go to college and all this stuff that you should normally do, but he just wanted to go and just be free and just explore and have fun in his life. So he went to uh, Bolivia or some weird place in, in the jungle. And he decided to, you know, just go to Bolivia and just wander around and see what he could experience and have fun and excitement and all this type of stuff. This kid and two of his buddies, they end up going into the jungle with this guy. It turns into this huge mess. Two of them die. He almost dies. He barely makes it out. He's, he's stuck in the jungle for 20, 25 days or whatever. And, you know, the other two, two of the guys, you know, they died. They never saw him again. They just got lost or killed in the jungle or whatever. But the point is, I'm just thinking, where does this mindset come from? That I'm just going to go and I'm just going to wander in the jungle. You know, there was another story of a kid that did that, and he went out, he just wandered, he was this middle class kid, he just gave everything up, and he just lived the life of a vagrant in the United States. He moved to Alaska, and he died. He walked off into the wilderness, and he died there. And you're just like, where is this mindset coming from? But here's the thing. Here's the thing. These, these kids that have this type of mindset, you know what they're doing? They're pursuing fun, and they're pursuing adventure, and they're pursuing these things, but you know what they're looking for? They're looking for purpose. They're looking for purpose in their life. And by pursuing entertainment and adventure and fun, you know what they're never going to find? Purpose. They're never going to find purpose. It's, I mean, it's, it's irony. It's irony, but I mean, we probably need to explain these things to our kids. We probably need to explain to our kids that, you know what? Supporting a, a, a ministry or, or living a day-to-day -day Christian life, you know what it's more about than fun? Look, there's fun in there. Okay? I mean, do we not have fun? There's fun in there. But you know what? You know what it really is? I don't want it to, to all be fun. I don't want it to just be fun time all the time. You know why? Because it's not fun time. You know what it is? It's service. It's service. I want to have a life of service. That's me personally. Because you know what? I want to have a life of purpose. I want to have a life that means something. And I want my kids to grow up, and I want my kids to be 18 or 19 years old or 20 years old, and I want them to understand what it means to have a life of purpose. Not stupid adventure and fun. And a life of purpose is going to have, you know what a life of purpose is going to have a lot of? It's going to have a lot of joy, which is different than fun. It's, it's a deep-seated feeling of purpose. That's what joy is. And what is our service? My service and your service as we're here every day, as we're cleaning the toilets in this building, as we're cleaning up 
the messes in this building, as we're cleaning up, as we're doing the things that just support the day-to-day -day operation of the church, look, that is a life of service to, to Jesus Christ, is what that is. And that is what you know, we need to be able to explain at the door to somebody that's just gotten saved. Hey, you know what? You don't need to go wander through the, the rainforest. You don't need to go and risk your life doing some stupid thing. You know what? Just give your life to a life of service and you'll have that life of purpose. Amen. And, and you'll have that joy. You know, I never, you know, that's, that's why we move. Because I never wanted to be one of those cold and timid souls, to quote Teddy Roosevelt, that never knew victory nor defeat. I wanted to be somebody that was, that was the Gideon that was in there. That was in there with the Gideons. That was in there with the Jephthahs. To, to fight those battles, to, to live that life of service. And, and look, there's, there's, there's fun along the way, and there's great joy along the way. We need to get that across to our kids. We're just not, you know, these Ephraims, and we're not raising these Ephraims that are just looking for these highs and just these, these, these momentary victories and these momentary fun moments in their lives. That's how you get a kid that goes and wanders off into the, into the jungle. And then, I mean, he writes a book and millions of people buy it. I mean, what in the world? Hey, I'm a moron. Amen. I got lost in the jungle. Buy my book. What? Who's buying these books? It's another story. But look, that is, that's what you need to get across to your kids, and that's the lesson from Ephraim. We don't want to be Ephraim. You want to be Gideon. You want to be Jephthah. You want to be in that fight, not just for the glory but for the service and for the purpose of the whole thing. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.